Back in the late 70s, we went to see a little movie you may or may not have heard of called Star Wars. We were not as old as we are now, so everything up on the screen was amazing and wonderful and filled our little heads with all sorts of fun new ideas to incorporate into our playtime once we got home. This was great! We could swing lightsabers instead of swords, be Jedi instead of cops, and if we were tall enough, we could play the Wookiee and people would have to let us win. But that's all there was. Just the one film, and best intentions aside, there was only so much you could use from it in your day-to-day -day playtime. We didn't know there would be more. We had no reason to suspect there would be more. The Rebels had won, the evil Darth Vader was flung off into space never to be heard from again, and all the heroes had been given a medal by the beautiful princess. Well, all except the Wookiee. But at least the princess was very beautiful, and she certainly seemed to like one of the heroes a whole heck of a lot. There's only so much play opportunity to be had from all that when you were only six or seven years old. The funny part was, we weren't sure who it was the princess liked the most. We were pretty sure it wasn't the Wookiee, so no problems there, but it was a toss-up as to whether she was going to hang out with Han or Luke the most after the Death Star blew up. We just couldn't tell. If Han and Luke got into a fight, whose side would Leia be on? Not Han's, we hoped, because he already had Chewbacca on his side, and that seemed more than enough. We just hoped she liked Luke the most. It seemed like he needed the most help if it came down to it. Besides, he seemed so... touchy. What we really needed was more information to go on. Well, we needn't have worried. Sure, we didn't know anything about a sequel coming along to help clarify things, but unbeknownst to us, Star Wars was just too successful to allow it to lay fallow while Lucas cobbled together another script from classical mythology. Someone had to do something to fill in the gap and keep it alive in our imaginations. And it turns out that someone would be a fellow named Alan Dean Foster. Foster had written the novelization of the first film based on drafts he was given and discussions he had with George Lucas, and we had dutifully read it in order to glean whatever additional information we could. But Foster was also contracted to write one additional novel, to be called Splinter of the Mind's Eye. And boy, howdy, what a novel it was. Luke and Leia are headed out on a diplomatic mission when their ships are disabled and crash land on a planet the locals call Mimban. There they learn about something called a Kyber Crystal, are captured by Imperials, escape, find a group of people who live underground, run up against Darth Vader, find an old temple, almost lose another fight with Vader, and barely escape with their lives. Now, that all sounds very exciting and was certainly worth a read as an eight-year-old the book having come out in 1978. It was all set just shortly after the Battle of Yavin that ended the first film, and boy did we learn lots of stuff. For one thing, we learned Vader had survived. Just seeing his silhouette on the cover was a big enough surprise. Second, we learned just how special Luke was. A Force-sensitive character named Hala clearly identifies him, and him alone, as the one strong in the Force. Leia's right there, but Hala gets nothing from her. Third, we learned kyber crystals were very powerful and could enhance a force user's power beyond belief. Fourth, during the final fight, Luke cuts off Vader's arm, crippling him. And fifth, and most important of all, we learned that Luke and Leia are very, very into each other. Certainly far more than they ought to be for people who will turn out to be brother and sister just two films later. And really, that was one of two problems with Splinter of the Mind's Eye. First, if you read it and realized that Lucas himself approved the book only requesting one change to the whole thing that had to do with a space battle, you'll be well aware Lucas had no idea where any of the story was going to go after Star Wars, in spite of many of his later claims. Second, the other problem with Mind's Eye was it just couldn't be canon. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The idea of something being canon or not can- No, wait. The idea of the canonicity of some- No. Whether something is canonical or not- 
Now, let's back up. We need to explain some terms first. First and foremost, we are not, at this time, talking about the big shooty thing you used to find on ships and castles. No, we're after the other sort of canon. The one everyone on the internet spends so much time arguing over for one piece of entertainment or another. The word canon, in the sense we want, comes to us through a Greek word that originally meant a rule or measuring stick. As such, it represents a law or standard against which something else can be measured. There's more to it than that, but we'll get back to it in a minute. The word canonical refers to things which conform to the canon that has been established. And the word canonicity describes the quality or state of being canonical. With us so far, good. Now the problem comes in with deciding which things are canon and which aren't, because remember, we said canon was more complicated than its etymological definition might suggest. It all begins with the church, as most complicated things that should really be very simple do. The early Christian church was the first to promote the idea of things being canon or not canon, that is, officially part of scripture and officially not part of scripture. This is called biblical canon or canon of scripture. Basically what happened was this. There were lots of things that could be considered official scripture, that is, the actual word of God as related to the various persons who recorded it all. The problem was that some bits of it could be seen as contradicting other bits of it, and that might lead one astray from God's actual intent. And since you couldn't have that, because it meant that depending on what you chose to believe and how you put it into practice based on what scripture you read, you would have a whole bunch of one-person factions and no agreement on what you were supposed to do to remain right with God. This was seen as mainly a bad thing and the cause of many a religious argument. What was needed was some agreement on which bits of scripture were okay and which ones weren't. How should someone live to be seen as righteous and good in God's eyes? In order to answer this essential question, the religious authorities of the day got together to debate each of the texts in question. And when agreement was reached, no one ever had to discuss it ever again because everything was settled agreeably forever. Which, of course, isn't at all true. We'd need a three-hour episode to even begin to discuss who considers which books canonical, but for starters, the Catholic Church recognizes 73 books as canonical, Protestants recognize anywhere from 66 to 80 books, depending on what type of Protestantism, and the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church recognizes 81 books. And they are all ostensibly Christian. Add in the Jewish Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, with which the Old Testament overlaps, the Greek Septuagint, which seems a bit like the Hebrew Bible with additions, and the fact that depending on what faith you follow determines how these books are divided up in the first place, and you begin to see why determining the canon for your particular belief system is so important. The textbook for your beliefs has to be consistent, or how can you be sure you are part of the faithful? And how can you be sure who isn't part of the faithful? And how will anyone know what the two different factions are arguing about? The canonicity of any given scripture is determined not just by debate among the leaders of a given religion. Texts must be compared to already accepted texts and checked for consistency. For example, events mentioned in one book have to not contradict the same event mentioned in another book. If someone claimed to be a fulfillment of a prophecy in one book, then the manner of fulfillment had to be checked against the prophecy as it first appeared in the earlier text in order for the one under consideration to be canonical. Languages, numbers, writing style, and more were all under consideration when it came to determining the canonicity of a given scripture. Different scholars and religious leaders all worked to different standards as well, and often there was little to no agreement on what books should and should not be considered canon. Unless, of course, some crisis was impending. For example, it took until the Protestant Reformation for the Council of Trent to affirm the Latin Vulgate Bible as the official Catholic Bible in 1546, just so they could then debate whether or not Martin Luther had a point with his new German translation of the Bible based on the original Hebrew and Greek. The problem was, Martin Luther's changes to the Bible as the Catholics understood it meant that seven books that had traditionally been considered as canon had in Luther's view of the new translations, lost their canonicity. 
The Old Testament books of Tobit, Judith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Book of Wisdom, Sirach, and Baruch were all moved to a section Luther called Apocrypha, or books that were not considered equal to the Holy Scriptures, but were still useful and good to read. But even amongst Protestants, Luther's changes were problematic. He removed the books of Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelations from the canon because he thought they went against the Protestant doctrines of sola scriptura and sola fide. At their simplest, sola scriptura holds that the Bible is the only infallible authority on Christian faith and practice, and that all other authority comes from it and so is subordinate to it. And sola fide states that only by their faith are believers made right with God, not their good works. Luther reckons that parts of the books he removed contradicted those two sola, and so naturally could not be considered part of his new biblical translations. But even some of the Protestants didn't like it, thinking it was a step too far. However, Luther's translations and their associated apocrypha, or as the Catholics called some of it, deuterocanonical works, eventually caught on with some Protestant churches, and Luther's Bible is still in use today. By the way, deuterocanonical just means belonging to the second canon. Which is exactly where Alan Dean Foster's Splinter of the Mind's Eye belonged, deuterocanon. Except no one knew it at the time. As far as anyone was aware, Mind's Eye was Word of God. Word of God is, as you might imagine, the official word about a creative work from whomever created that work, the ultimate authority, the primary creator or creators. This could be the writer in the case of books, the director in the case of films, and sometimes even producers depending on their level of involvement. In some cases, there are even multiple sources for the word of God depending on how fraught development and production were which gets very confusing for the hardcore dedicated fan who feels the need to prove how big a fan they are by knowing the official version of everything. The Word of God is meant to settle disputes about details not present in the original work. Was Blade Runner's Deckard a replicant or not? The film's director, Ridley Scott, says he was, and that's as Word of God as you can get. So that's settled then. Except. Nearly everyone else involved in the film thinks otherwise. Harrison Ford, who played Deckard, says no. The film's producers say no. The people who wrote the screenplay say no. Even Philip K. Dick, who wrote the novel the film was based on, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?, says no. But Scott says yes, he was, and so you're stuck. Deckard was a replicant. But there are different levels of canon when it comes to creative works like films and books. We mentioned one of them, Deuterocanon, which is colloquially known as the Word of St. Paul. The idea being that St. Paul helped define the early beliefs of Christianity without being the originator of the source material. He wasn't God, or more appropriately, one of the Trinity, but he was the next best thing. Word of St. Paul kicks in when the original creator of a work elects not to comment on or clarify details of a particular work. It then falls to someone else, a secondary creator, to provide information and fill in gaps. Sometimes even gaps that no one knew existed until the St. Paul in question comments on them. For instance, Brendan Fraser is on record as having stated that his character Sergeant Stone in G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra is a descendant of his character Rick O'Connell from the Mummy films. Tom Holland said that the kid wearing the Iron Man mask in Iron Man 2 is a very young Peter Parker, and Alan Tudyk gave a backstory for his Firefly character Wash that involved running supplies, being shot down, captured, and then buying his life with entertaining puppet shows. Since no one has contradicted any of these people, these are generally accepted as word of St. Paul when it comes to discussing their canonicity in regard to the original works. Are they what the Creator intended? The Creator hasn't said, so they can stand as lesser canon until someone states otherwise. Sometimes, though, neither primary nor secondary creators have commented on a particular aspect of a work, but everyone knows that a certain element must be true given what's on the page or screen. Usually these facts come from sources not even remotely associated with the original work, instead coming from some sort of outside authority. Often, the source is a scholar of the original work, or someone who has created an adaptation based on the original. 
Very occasionally, the new information comes from someone generally respected by the rest of the fans as being one of the most knowledgeable people involved in the fandom. In each case, though, providing evidence to support the new assertion is crucial. This then becomes the word of Dante. It's a peculiarity of Christian belief in particular that much of what Christians know about hell comes from Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. We've touched on this before in our episode on Malabranche, but to summarize, between Dante's Divine Comedy and John Milton's Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, the Western ideas of both the devil and hell are pretty well ingrained. The Bible only really says that hell is a place of darkness and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a lake of fire. All that stuff about circles and specific punishments on each level, and particular tortures for particular kinds of sinners, is all information introduced by Dante. And as we mentioned in the Malabranche episode, Dante had more than one axe to grind. From Milton, we got the traditional Satan we've all come to expect. Seriously, go listen to the episode. The word of Dante has given us such gems as, well, such as most every retelling of a fairy tale by Disney. In many cases, the Disney version of such tales as Beauty and the Beast, no really, see our episode on that one, The Little Mermaid, Snow White, and even The Three Little Pigs are now better known than the originals. But Disney isn't the primary creator of these tales. As popular as the Cthulhu mythos is, H.P. Lovecraft did throw the door wide open for other people to add to the mythos canon in a word of Dante manner. Even people who weren't directly working on the Cthulhu mythos got a shot at it thanks to lifting elements of the mythos into other works. One of Lovecraft's devices, the Necronomicon, or Book of the Dead, originally was said to contain an account of the big bads of the Cthulhu universe, the Old Ones, along with instructions on how to summon them. Pretty bad in the first place, but only made worse by the Sam Raimi film Evil Dead 2, in which the Necronomicon gained the ability to also raise the dead as zombies, a fact which is now accepted as part and parcel of what the Necronomicon is, even though it never featured in any of Lovecraft's stories. Still, you can begin to see how complicated canon is, and how divisive it can be. Answering the question of what counts as canon for a particular work has far-reaching implications, not just for the faithful, but for those who come along to create subsequent works. Alan Dean Foster and Splinter of the Mind's Eye may have been the first book to add to the Star Wars canon, such as it was at the time, but it was certainly not the last. As of this recording, there are somewhere around 380 Star Wars books available to read by just anyone. And the problem with all of them is consistency. Fans want established details and facts to be kept consistent through each book, but after the first hundred or so, that gets to be a daunting task, and more than one author over the years has had to change proposed details and storylines in a Star Wars book to bring it in line not only with what was already known about the Star Wars universe, but also with what George Lucas thought he knew about the Star Wars universe, but wasn't telling anyone. It's a matter of legend now, but in his days running Lucasfilm, George reportedly read every book proposal and outline. Only after they passed canon muster would they be printed. Which makes explaining what was going on in Mind's Eye a bit tricky. Fortunately, a solution was at hand and swiftly employed. To quote official Lucasfilm statements in the first issue of Star Wars Insider magazine, Gospel, or canon as we refer to it, includes the screenplays, the films, the radio dramas, and the novelizations. These works spin out of George Lucas's original stories. The rest are written by other writers. However, between us, we've read everything, and much of it is taken into account in the overall continuity. The entire catalog of published works comprises a vast history, with many offshoots, variations, and tangents, like any other well-developed mythology. Basically, if George didn't create it himself or have a direct hand in creating it, it wasn't canon. It fell into something that would come to be referred to as the expanded universe. Like Greek mythology, there were many versions of a given story and many versions of how those stories were interpreted. They were all equally valid in their own way, but some were more valid than others. You had the originals and then the derivatives of the originals. And for many years, this seemed to work out quite well. You could read and enjoy many Star Wars stories for what they were. Stories set in the Star Wars universe, 
which were mostly variations on the themes of Star Wars. If you wanted to know what was technically real in this made-up universe, you only had to look for the hand of George himself. If it was present, then it counted. If his hand wasn't present, well, just have a good read and don't worry too much. And then, along came Star Wars' own Luther, in the form of the Disney Corporation. There was a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of pages suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. And that's the only Star Wars quote you're getting from us. By the time Disney came along to buy up Lucasfilm and the Star Wars franchise, the expanded universe, in spite of everyone's best intentions, had become so convoluted and confusing that you really couldn't keep track of everything anymore. And the prospect of adding to that in any rational way was pretty daunting. So Disney declared that all of it was null and void. Virtually none of it was any kind of canonical anymore. In one fell swoop, they had undone virtually everything written about Star Wars over the last 45 or so years. Suddenly, it was all legends. None of it was meant to be taken as canon any longer. Welcome to Star Wars Apocrypha. Fun to read, but not to be taken seriously. Which is exactly the sort of thing you have to do if what you want is to produce new films set during the post-Return of the Jedi times which is where so much of the new Apocrypha was set. Especially if you didn't want fans pointing to those books and saying how much better your sequels would have been if you just followed some of them instead of whatever it was they actually did. We don't know. We stopped watching. Also, as far as we're concerned, Boba Fett died in the Great Pit of Carcoon. End of. Thanks for listening. Sure, we're a bit bitter about the course of Star Wars over the years, but who isn't by this point? Certainly not anyone who's a true fan. We kid, of course. There are many valid wrong ways to enjoy Star Wars. As always, this episode and others just like it are supported by our patrons on Patreon. Through their support, the episodes keep coming, and if you'd like to help keep them coming, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top to find out how you can help support the show. You can get transcripts and early episodes for just one Patreon dollar, which is nearly as cheap as free. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who will not insert an additional Star Wars quote here, because he has a bad feeling about it. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Everything I've worked on has been considered canon.